Well, I hope that you all are enjoying the summit so far. My name is Felicia Love. I am a housing investigator with the Michigan Department of Civil Rights, and I work in our Grand Rapids office. I would like to introduce our moderator for this session from roadblocks to building blocks, removing barriers to help home buyers build wealth and equity. We will be discussing both barriers and best practices in real estate, in the industry, and home buying process. Our moderator is Gail Harvey. Gail is the housing chair of the NAACP's Michigan State Conference. She is also the owner of Gail Harvey Homes, which handles residential, commercial, and corporate sales and relocation. Gail also provides seminars for prospective home buyers and is committed to her community in Grand Rapids. So please, let's uh, welcome Gail, and I'll turn everything over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. good afternoon. Thank you so much for that warm welcome, Ms. Felicia. I appreciate that. Um, so as she said, so I am Gail Harvey, and um, lots going on here, <laughs> especially in this housing industry. I am appreciative to be here. I just want to reach out to MDCR and say thank you so much um, for putting uh, these things on and giving information and taking information and working, trying to um, help people um, in discrimination. So that's very important. I'd like to present to you our panelists. Our first panelist is Mr. Jay Kilgore, City Commissioner, City of Muskegon, and Associate Broker of Pinnacle Realty. Erica C. People, President of Housing Kent. Paul Kiefer, Community Reinvestment and Fair Lending Production Manager in Grand Rapids Market Integration Executive, Integration Executive at the Bank of America. And Michael Tierney, Community Bankers Association. So we're going to just give you some information up front on how this is going to go. Give me just a moment. We'll start out, I'm going to scoot this over a little bit. We'll start out with the ground rules. So before we get started, this work is about fair housing. Not just housing, we are focused on bias, discrimination, and this desperate impacts in buying or renting a home or related to credit ratings and mortgages. We would like to end this session with two to three specific policy recommendations for moving fair housing forward. We welcome comments with potential solutions for the issues being discussed Please keep discussions focused on the topic of discussion. For example, we are unable to address individual complaints or circumstances in this session. We are focused on board policy discussions. In closing remark, we were going to um, let you know as well. We could discuss the topics that we're going to discuss um, all day because there's so much information that's necessary. And we'd like to thank our panelists ahead of time uh, for their speakings and the, the um, uh, information that they are planning to give. So we're going to start already with our panel uh, questions. We're all set for that. Um, each one of you, if you'd like to take the question, we can do that and just come introduce yourselves and we'll start that way, okay? Okay. So our first panel uh, question is going to be, how does organizations, how do organizations respond 
when there is concern or allegation of discrimination? Who would like to take that question? Uh, hi, so uh, I'm Paul Please Kiefer. Introduce yourself. As yes, well. sorry. Uh, Paul Kiefer. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. Uh, I'm from Bank of America. <clears throat> um, and so, you know, for us, when we, when we think about a, a complaint or, or an escalation coming in that, that may be discrimination focused, uh, we, we treat that a little differently, right? Because we get complaints all day, every day. You know, we're a big, you know, massive scale company. Uh, but if anything, you know, it sounds like it's you know, a potential discrimination issue or you know, a potential compliance issue with either ADA or the Fair Housing Act or, or our CRA requirements, that is then routed to a specialty team who handles that. And the way we look at it is both vertically, you know, for the line of business that might own that issue, how do they respond to it, but also locally. So we have 97 market presidents across the country, one here in Detroit, one in Grand Rapids, and every other city we serve. And so rather than just keeping those complaints or, or potential discrimination issues siloed to, to the line of business that owns it, we also engage that local market team so that we know that, hey, if something's going on in Detroit, we want our local leadership in Detroit to be involved and know about it as well. That's awesome. awesome. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Um, my next question is going to be, what can we do? What can we be doing to create more equitable home ownership? Who would like to take that one? Um, I can take that question. And my name is Eureka, by the way, Eureka People uh, with Housing Kent. And um, so I'll actually do my introduction. Please as a way of answering this Perfect. question. So Thank I'm you. gonna time myself because they said <laughs> I had seven minutes for this introduction. So it starts now. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background before I answer the question, um, Housing Kent is an organization that um, supports a network, a private and public sector network called the Housing Stability Alliance. And we are specifically trying to create a stable housing system across Kent County, Michigan. And so essentially that means that we're trying to increase access to affordable housing, dissolve homelessness, and eliminate racial uh, biases in the housing system. And in order for us to do that, we have to work with the public sector, the private sector, the social sector, as well as people who are impacted by housing instability. As many of you know in this room, um, the American dream, which often is defined by home ownership, is at risk uh, for many people. Um, I love to, that Langston Hughes poem, right? It's a dream deferred, uh, but for some, it's actually the American dream has now turned into the American nightmare when it comes to housing discrimination and fair housing claims that they have actually experienced. And even in Kent County alone, uh, one of our key measures that we're looking at actually is home ownership. And the largest gap in home ownership is between the black and the white home owners. Kent County actually ranks the fifth worst in the nation of comparable counties as it relates to the black white home ownership gap. We are 144 out of 149, with the white home ownership rate at 76%, and the black home ownership rate hovering around 32 to 34%. So then we have to ask ourselves, what are the factors that are causing that discrimination and that disparity, and then how do we close them? The obvious answer is, you know, we could address redlining, we could talk about mortgage lending, we could talk about all of these other things that, um, are pretty obvious to a lot of folks. Our work is to look across the housing system from no housing to housing stability or from homelessness to renter affordability to home ownership affordability and try to figure out what's the comprehensive set of solutions that needs to be presented to really address that. And so the first thing that we do, um, we've created some tools to help answer that for us um, that are replicable across any county. The first tool is a housing data dashboard. The second tool we created was actually an equitable home ownership um, that actually looks at all the U.S. counties and where they rank. And so when it comes to the housing data dashboard, if you see the diagram behind me, um, we started to look at the market because if you're really gonna address housing fairness, you have to look at the housing market and the economy. 
And what we came to discover um, was what we know, but oftentimes it's when you see it, it becomes real, is that home ownership growth has significantly outpaced wage growth. And so home ownership prices, or home sale prices rather, have been like escalating at a rate of about 126% where wage growth has been about stagnant at 26%. So then you have to say, how do we then bridge that gap? And even if the market cools, for example, that gap is still gonna be there for many Americans, and disproportionately, it's gonna be there for black Americans, because again, we're uh, the lowest earning income folk on the spectrum in the United States, and specifically in Kent County. So then what would be the policies that would need to be enacted in order to close that gap, but also what would be the policies that would need to be enacted to create more affordable housing units at the lower end of the market? The second thing, even if you scroll up on that diagram on our, on our dashboard, you'll see is there are no affordable housing <coughs> units in Kent County. Literally, there might have been five units at entry level that were available. So then you get into, again, how do you close that gap of home ownership when there are no housing units available and you can't close that um, gap between home sale prices and wages? The second thing that we're looking at is not only is the market data and kind of like the geography, is we're also going upstream to renter affordability. When it comes to renter affordability, um, blacks in Kent County are disproportionately affected in that more than half of the black renters are actually cost burden, which means they pay at a minimum $400 more in rent on a monthly basis than they can actually afford. So again, it's what policies need to be enacted to help subsidize or close or narrow that renter gap because we know stable renters become homeowners. And if you can't pay for basic needs or childcare or transportation, you definitely don't have the money to save for a house in order to position yourself for that. And then the third thing that we're looking at that's not necessarily on our dashboard and we can't figure out how to measure yet is public sentiment because the voting population by and large is often white, older homeowners, but they are not affected by the current conditions in the housing market. In fact, they are largely disengaged because they're not in the game to buy a new home until their children or their grandchildren are impacted by it. So then how then do we engage them publicly, invite them into the public narrative so that they will now say, what do we need to do to make sure that the housing market, housing affordability, and then wage disparities can be addressed so that our children and our children's children can own homes and therefore <coughs> the black population can also become homeowners. Um, and so one of our goals that we're trying to achieve, quite frankly, it's, it's a long shot Hail Mary, is that we need 7,700 new black homeowners in Kent County to close the gap, which is about 430 new black homeowners per year. And so it's a big, heavy lift. We're at the start of that journey in my last 26 seconds. We're on year three of like a 10 year horizon and stay tuned, because I'm confident with me at the helm, we're going to get it done. <laughs> <All right. clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Peoples. Um, and we, we got your back, too. Thank we're you. Gonna, we're, listen, we're going we're gonna to watch you do it. Hello, everyone. My name is Jay Kilgo. I am um, I'm a real estate broker, but I'm also a city commissioner in the city of Muskegon. Uh, I'm also the president of our local NARAB chapter for West Michigan, the Realtors of West Michigan Association. Any Realtors in the house? Okay, well, I got to get all you. Oh, okay, I got a Realtors in the I got to get the rest of you guys to join NARAB. But, um, so I, I kind of wanted to, to answer both questions that she asked. Uh, the first question was, how do organizations respond when complaints come in? Well, um, NARAB's been around since 1947 because people that look like me couldn't be real tours. So a group of 12 people went to Tampa, Florida and created NARAB and coined the term real tists. So NARAB has a large pool nationally and they actually have done a lot of the policy making that's in DC uh, over the years um, from the Fair Housing Act to different civil rights acts along the way. 
But we have a division called RED, uh, the Realtors Escalation Department, that when we run into uh, civil rights complaints, uh, discrimination complaints, we do work with our local Fair Housing Center of West Michigan, but we also have a uh, RED department, so the Escalation Department. And both of those in tandem work well. Um, and I can think of a few cases in West Michigan that we've had <clears throat> that have been taken care of because we have people uh, in these spaces that have our back. Um, the other question that she asked, what can we be doing to create more equitable um, home ownership? That's a big question. It's a big apple, right? There's going to be a lot of pieces and a lot of bites to take off of that. There are many things we can do to create more equitable home ownership here in Michigan and across the country. Um, there are so many factors that we have to think about. Um, and we, we have to think about them comprehensively because there's income and wages and there's home prices. Home prices are different in different parts of our state and different, you know, urban to suburban, uh, the home prices. In, in the city of Muskegon, we're probably doing the best job in Michigan, not just West Michigan. We're probably doing the best job in Michigan of building new affordable housing. Um, and I definitely would encourage regular citizens, nonprofits, realtors, lenders, to talk to your local elected officials and get them to have a pro-housing view on your communities. Uh, because there's federal money, there's state money that we can use that they can put into building new houses. And I'm seeing it in my city, not all new houses that are built have to be starting price $300,000 or $400,000. We have new homes that we're building starting at $130,000. And they can do it and they can subsidize some of those costs of those homes to get people in the homes because you said the number was about 7,000 homes that are needed. For us to get 7,000 homes in one city or across the state, we are going to have to build more housing. Whether it's denser housing or single family housing, we have to build newer housing. In one of the sessions earlier that I was sitting in, she was talking about how old our housing inventory. Yes, some of our older houses need rehab. They need that energy efficiency so people can afford to stay in those homes, but we're also gonna have to have new housing available for people. Go ahead, you know Thank you, you have to do Mr. your Campbell. intro. I appreciate it. Yeah. I just want to say I've got um, a couple of you as well that when I introduced you, I wanted you to give a little information about yourselves and what you do. So thank you so much, Mr. Eureka, yes. for catching that for me. <laughs> and thank you, Mr. Kilgo, for doing that. And if you would give a little information as well on you and what you do. All right. And, and you'll be next. Okay, thanks. Can thank you hear you. me? Uh, I'm Mike Tierney with Community Bankers. Um, I have a 47-year career in banking. Um, I spent time uh, at the two largest banks here, Comerica and Chase, uh, as a senior executive, and I was the CEO of a couple of banks here. Um, one that's now part of Huntington through mergers, and one, uh, the name's still around, but they're merging to something else as CEO of Flagstar, too. Uh, but the last eight years, I've been running the Community Bankers Association of Michigan. We represent all the banks in the state of Michigan. So these are banks that are actually headquartered here in the state of Michigan. We don't represent banks like Paul's Bank. Uh, they're from another state. Uh, we, some of them are members, and, but they're not voting members. But we represent the banks like First Independence here in town, uh, Independent Bank, you name it. Anybody who's located here in the state of Michigan, we represent them. We also re represent about 140 other companies that do business with banks. Um, and so I'm really here to talk on behalf of them and to, you know, encourage you when you want to or someone you know wants to buy a house, go to a bank or go to a credit union and before you want to buy a house, try to start a relationship with the bank or a credit union. 
And you can also get a, we're sitting here in Rocket Mortgage, they're the number <coughs> one lender in Detroit. You know, go to them, go to United Wholesale, they're great uh, and reputable firms. But it helps for you to get a relationship and relationships still count. Uh, at any of the banks headquartered here in Michigan, all the people who make decisions for them are Michigan residents. And they care about the local Michigan economy and they care about making loans in their community, so they want to try to help you. You know, I think we'll, we'll talk about a lot of the housing inequities and steps that have been taken, you know, to make sure that uh, we eliminate as many of them as possible. But banks are highly regulated organizations. We've got so many regulations that we have to do. Uh, and things have changed in my 47 years. Uh, we actually pulled this out for a testimony in Congress. We showed them a mortgage from 40 years ago. The stack's about this high. There's about 40 pieces of paper in it. Today, stack is up here. There's about 180 <laughs> pieces of paper. And it's a lot more expensive to do a deal now. Uh, there's a lot more regulation, and it just takes longer to get one done. Uh, but there are a lot of opportunities. Uh, and there are things that are hurting us right now, uh, and just a few things kind of on the various vehicles you can use. Most of us in this room cannot be cash buyers. I certainly can't. I, I don't know if any of you can. Maybe some of you can. But cash buyers, cash is always king. They always have the advantage over every other buyer mm -hmm. because there's no contingencies. They can close in two weeks. They don't have to get an appraisal. So any seller is going to take a cash buyer over anybody else. Um, now the drawback is those buyers don't have the advice and guidance of appraisers, of realtors like Gail, who are going to give them great advice and keep them out of some of the pitfalls. And they're not going to get an advice, they're not going to get advice from Paul's Bank or any of the banks that I represent that'll keep them out of a lot of problems too. Traditional mortgages, conventional, FHA, VA, uh, conventional is a better way to go if you qualify. There's fewer hurdles to jump through, but there's fewer people that are going to qualify. FHA and VA, you're going to get lower down payments, could be as low as 3%. And they've got programs to lend you money for some of the fees and other things that you can do. And the Federal Home Loan Bank, Jamie Carver is here from the Federal Home Loan Bank of Indianapolis. They have great programs that can get you down payment assistance and home repair assistance. We'll talk about some of those later. Uh, but you can have a lower credit score, uh, you know, with the FHA, VA deal, um, and your debt to income requirements uh, can be lower. But you are going to run into problems with an FHA or VA loan in condo complexes and some HOAs. We'll talk about why that happens, uh, and some of you can ask those questions. Um, there is a discrimination element to it. There's also an economic element to it, so we'll talk about both of those elements. But I'd encourage you to go to a reputable lender. Banks have to comply with the Community Reinvestment Act. We have to find ways to lend into low and moderate income communities. A bank can't do a merger. A bank can't do expansion into other markets if they don't have a satisfactory CRA rating. So they are incented to do it. Credit unions do not have to comply with CRA. They're not regulated like banks are. They're still great. I'm not, I don't represent them, uh, so I'm not going to say too much nice about them, but they're fine too. They're local and they're going to make local decisions, uh, but they don't have the same incentives to lend into low to moderate income communities that banks do. But no matter who you use, go to a reputable player uh, because they're going to treat you right. They're going to do everything they can to help you. Last thing is land contracts. There's some legislation going on in Michigan, and uh, I wrote a paper for one of your local reps, Christian Grant, mm -hmm. uh, on land contracts and the pitfalls to watch out for. We don't do land contracts as banks. They are contracts between two individuals. They're private deals, but banks will occasionally service those land contracts on behalf of the seller uh, because they don't know how to service them. They don't have the tools to service them, so we'll, we'll do that occasionally. Now, land contracts are a good way, if you want to move property between yourself and a family member, two trusted sources, 
they're a pretty decent tool for doing that. It can be a lot simpler. But there's no place where there is more abuse than with land contracts. And if you have an unscrupulous seller, they have so many opportunities to take advantage of you as the buyer under a land contract. So I just warn you, and typically in the land contract, you don't have a realtor representing you that's going to help you. You don't have a bank in there because they're not part of that financing transaction. Uh, you will have a title company, but any of the other professionals that would help advise you in that transaction, they're not part of it. So you're on your own. So you really have to go hire some real estate professionals to represent you. But I'm really looking forward to taking a lot of questions from you later on, and I'm going to stick around afterwards. Uh, so if any of you do have individual things you want to talk about, and Jamie's going to be here too, we'll talk with you about it and try to find solutions for you. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, we'll try to run down any issues that you have with the uh, financial services industry here in Michigan. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, um, so, yeah, by way of a, a more lengthy introduction, so, um, you know, I, I really like uh, what Mr. Tierney was talking about with uh, having that reputable partner with a bank, right? So the, the two things that, that really come to mind when I think about equitable housing and, and what we're doing and what a lot of our partner organizations are doing, uh, you know, peers and competitors are, are doing to, to try to uh, address it, is when all the laws that, that uh, were referenced there were written, it was like the 1960s and the 1970s. The market is vastly different now. The challenges are vastly different. The population is larger, right? But even as the population grows, the amount of available space in the country does not grow. So how do we get more creative with our solutions? Accessory dwelling units, um, being able to build further up, being able to do things like sixplexes and fourplexes instead of single family homes. Those are things that need to be addressed at the county and state and, and, and city level. The other thing that I really look at is, is the outreach piece, right? We have a ton of banks. I would imagine almost everybody that, that um, Community Bankers represents and Federal Home Loan Bank has really unique products and programs, right? Grant programs, community seconds, down payment assistance. All of that is great, but we can't rely on people just finding it and coming into our centers, our financial centers to talk about it. It is a, a sad reality that whether it was 50 years ago or five days ago, there are people who have walked into a bank branch, whether it's a big national bank or a local community bank, sat across from someone who looks like me and been treated unfairly. And so I can't expect that person to come back and ask about my down payment grant program. I can't expect them to come back and let me give, give me the chance to earn their business again. Right? We have to go out. We have to get the message out. And we have to get the message to the community about what we can offer and how we can help create the dream or fulfill the dream of home ownership. Because the other thing that, that we see a lot is <clears throat> a lot of people have a lot of misconceptions about home ownership. The average um, first time home buyer, 51% according to a Freddie Mac study, uh, believes you need 20% down to buy a house. Mm -hmm. The number that's always quoted in the media is that $400,000 or $420,000 is the average home price in America, which is true. Those numbers don't apply to Detroit. Those numbers don't apply to Grand Rapids. Those don't apply to Michigan, right? Because you're, you're averaging California and New York and everywhere else into there. But you think about that buyer who comes in or that person who's, who's reading the social media article or thinking about home ownership. In their head, they think 20% down, $420,000. I need 84 grand in the bank before I even start thinking about owning a home. That is, you know, to, to somebody who is paycheck to paycheck or only saving you know, a few hundred dollars a month, that seems like insurmountable. But we know, everybody on this stage knows, our Federal Home Loan Bank partner knows, that there are programs that can get folks there much, much faster, right? With down payment assistance, with grants, with low down mortgages. Um, we have a, a program here in, in Wayne County, a special purpose credit program, where we're piloting 0% down, where we actually gift equity in the house, right? So it's not a silent second. Uh, I know some of that was in the news recently. Zero closing costs and not looking at a FICO score. And the reason that we're not looking at a FICO score is I, I think there's been broad conversations about there is bias in that three-digit score, right? Distilling a person down to three numbers doesn't always take into account what their, their journey is, what their lived experience is. So yes, do we, we look at payment history? Do we look at, at responsible borrowing? Absolutely. But we said, hey, let's, let's look at it on an individual basis versus looking at a three-digit number. Um, so, but when we do things like that, 
again, we can't just you know, keep it in our four walls. We've got to make sure that we're, we're working with partners. Uh, we have a great relationship with our realtors uh, here on the east side of the state with that program. Uh, we work with a number of other uh, nonprofits and realtor organizations to get the word out. Um, you know, it's, it's something where a lot of people can benefit, they just don't know. They don't know that, hey, I can get started and I can get on the path to home ownership and it may only take six months, nine months, a year versus how long would it take me to save that 84 grand? And by the way, I, by the time I save it, that price of that house has gone up again. Right, and so yeah. it's it's this self-perpetuating mm -hmm. cycle, um, and so you know being able to get that information out there is critical, and understanding where do people get their information. You know, I'm like the oldest millennial in the world, but I'm still technically a millennial, uh, and so my generation gets gets their information from social media, and it's unmoderated, and anybody gets you know their their voice amplified on it. Um, you know, but it's how do we get folks to talk to realists? How do we get folks to talk to? housing counselors? How do we get them to talk to reputable bankers from community banks all the way up <coughs> to big national banks to get the right information out there? So um, that I think is step one on, on a very large list of steps that need to be taken. Um, I think Jay talked a little bit about the supply side as well. Um, one of the things we're encountering now, again, you know, population growth, uh, we need more units built, mm -hmm. but you're also seeing this, you know, folks who, who got that 2%, 3% interest rate uh, five years ago, they're not selling, right? Mm -hmm. The nominal interest rate, the interest rate that we quote when you come in for a mortgage has skyrocketed in the last three years. It's seven, seven, three quarters, something like that right now. Mm -hmm. The effective interest rate, what homeowners actually pay on their existing mortgages is pretty flat, right? It maybe bumped up a little bit. It's probably in about the three and a half percent range now. So those folks just aren't selling those houses. So, mm -hmm. you know, we can either cross our fingers and hope that the Fed does something and, and interest rates drop again and, and you know, that injects more activity into the cycle. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. <laughs> Jay got there a little faster than I did, but, uh, but it, it's got to be how do we build? How do we build in an equitable way? We talk about equitable access to credit for, for homeowners. What about equitable access to credit for developers? What about mm -hmm. equitable access to the technical expertise you need to be a contractor or, or a subcontractor? Um, that's got to be a part of the conversation as well. Uh, you know, Eureka, I think, speaks about this better than anyone because she's seeing the system, you know, 360 degrees. So. That was awesome, y'all. Good information. Yeah, give them all a hand. All of that information is necessary, and it's just, um, Thank you for talking about the um, amounts and the down payments and things like that because you're right. People don't understand that. Mm -hmm. And so as an agent, what I always do is direct you right to the lender first. Because while you're waiting, you could be waiting, like they said, forever. Mm -hmm. So talk to them. Let them tell you what you need to do. And then go from there. It may be shorter than you think. So thank you again, my panel, for uh, giving all of that information. And now we'll get into uh, some questions, if I may, of my panel. So I've got a question here. I'd like to know what are some of the barriers that are keeping minorities out of the home space and where can they create equity? And I think Eureka, you would probably be a good one to answer that for me if you would. Yeah, um, well, you know, there's several ways to answer that mm -hmm. one. Uh, mm -hmm. So the obvious barrier obviously is that many people who are people of color cannot afford um, to purchase a home. I mean, quite frankly, because they just don't have the earning income. But again, as my colleagues up here will tell you, there might be some special purpose credit programs or other ways to get down payment assistance or closing costs to be able to bridge that gap. But there's still large inequities, dollar for dollar, in terms of how much a white person earns in the United States versus a black person earns in the United States. I think the last number, I think, is was 53 cents on the dollar, I think might be what it is. Um, so there's still a pay equity gap that has to be addressed. Um, so that's, that's one thing. That's one critical barrier. And then on top of that, again, there's the barrier of even if you could qualify, where are you going to get a home, especially in this housing market, because there is a scarcity of affordable housing units at the lower end of the market, no matter where you live. 
thank God in Muskegon you could build a home for $130,000. Uh, in yeah, in for Kent sure. County, I think the lowest one, you might be able to find one or two on the market or less than a handful under $200,000 that are new builds, but the new builds are really coming in around 260, 280, yeah. or something like that. And so even if you're earning a median <laughs> wage a little less than $43,000 a year, you can't afford to get the home. Um, so, or qualify for the home. So there's the other question of incentivizing um, developers to build affordable homes, but then also changing zoning laws to create more density, which basically means to allow different types of housing units. Um, they call it, sometimes it's the missing middle, so it's the duplexes, triplexes, multifamily units, all of those types of things to be able to uh, be built. But then, again, we're looking at the housing system, not to, not to overwhelm you, but then that leads to another problem, which is, but where are they gonna build these, even if you change all the zoning laws, because there's not a whole lot of land available to build, um, at least not in Kent County. And then, so if you're thinking about building, oftentimes in the rural areas, then you get other challenges where there's not transportation lines that can pick up people who are earning lower incomes to bring them in. And so then they're pushed further and further away from the economic job centers. So then where are they gonna work to be able to sustain a living? And so it really is a system problem of epic proportions. But again, it is solvable, I promise you, if we can bring all the right people at the table um, to have the conversation and really have a comprehensive kind of approach to urban planning. But those are just a couple of things. It's not just the home buyer, but it's the system. It's, it's the public officials enacting policy. It's the developers being incentivized. It's the landlords, you know, really, you know it's, it's everybody has a role to play in order for the system to work properly. It has to be together, yes, correct. Thank you so much for that. Um, my next question, I'd like to go to Paul, and what is key to gain momentum in home ownership? Yeah, so I think the key to gaining momentum is really about building that believership, right? Build, re reintroducing the American dream, um, that it is possible that if you, if you do work hard, uh, that it's in the cards for you, right? You know, we, we, I talked a little bit earlier about some of the misconceptions that are out there. You know, that's, that's just a small amount of misconceptions that are out there. At the end of the day, there is no greater driver of generational wealth than home ownership, right? And that has Amen. been the case since the dawn of the country. Uh, it is, you know, the, the, the asset that not only fulfills one of your absolute most basic needs for shelter, but also typically increases in value over time and is one of the things that when you pass it down to the next generation has the most, call it tax advantageous way of, of, of passing property forward. Um, you know, I know there's, there's a lot of stories of a lot of families where, you know, they've had a family home uh, you know, in, in, for generations and generations. You know, my wife grew up on a farm. Uh, actually, in, in a couple of weeks, we're going to go celebrate the 100th birthday of that farm, wow. that farm and that farmhouse. Nice. And so to be able to say, like, that is, that is a piece of their legacy yeah. is something I think everybody can strive for and everybody wants. Yes. But if all you're hearing all day, every day is it's not for our generation or it's not for this community or that community, um, you know, it's, it, it's hard to, to overcome that, right? And so I, I think the, you know, the answer is, is again, that, that group or that systemic approach, right, is how do we get media involved? How do we get uh, lawmakers involved, you know, uh, you know city and, and county and, and folks like that to, to really reinforce the same message that, yeah, there are pathways. There are absolutely programs and pathways that can help. City of Detroit did a fantastic down payment assistance program um, you know, about a year and a half ago um, that, that enabled that dream for I think it was six or 800 families within a, a few month time frame, right? And so the more stories of that that get out there that, that are put out in the public, the, the better we can change perception. I like that. Very important to get the information out that people understand it. So that's awesome. Let me just get one more in on my, my panel. Um, Jay, if I could have you answer this one. What is the potential impact of AI land, I'm sorry, is growing use in your industry and home ownership? And how do you recommend we ensure data is not uh, biased? Well, they kind of talked about that in a session this morning um, with some of the tools that lenders 
are using, we're using to qualify people for home ownership. Um, it's almost like we need forensic audits for <clears throat> the data collections that we're using now. I think that would be the simplest answer because I'm not in that space and I, like they said earlier, some of that is proprietary information. Mm -hmm. Well, somebody needs to be let in the door to see what the information is and see where they're pulling That's data right. from. Yeah. Because looking at the end results, which I see, I know that some of that data is corrupt or biased or not equitable across exactly. the board. Um, the, the question that you asked before, though, what's one of the keys to home ownership? Mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure that I said this. Mm -hmm. Let's just take a hypothetical. We build all the houses. There's enough housing stock for everybody that needs one. And um, we get special purpose credit programs or down payment assistance. We still have to have education and we have to have consistent, available education for the people that live in marginalized communities because they may be they may, mom and dad were renters, grandma and grandpa were renters, they might be the first homeowner in their family. Exactly. We have to have um, available resources for these people to take home buyers classes, take overall financial wealth education classes, because they might, hey, I've been working at GM for 10 years, I make a decent amount of money, mm -hmm. But they have a low credit score and they don't know how to save money or they don't know how to maybe invest a little bit or just different little things that can maybe help put some of these people into homes. We have to make sure so the nonprofits, the the one, oh yeah, my company, we got a certified HUD counselor, or you know, there's a realtist or somebody who's a certified home counselor. We have to get together and hey, here's a calendar. I don't care if you go to hers, mine, his, his and just get that information out to the citizens so they can know, hey, I work thirds, I can't do that one. Oh, here's one that's available for me that's right in the middle of the after, I could go to this one. Or here's one that's online and I could go to this one. If we are not educating people, it doesn't matter how many houses we build in, in our communities, if we're not teaching people how they can buy these homes. So I just want to make sure I said that. Excellent. The Information AI is key. Yes, please. Information is key. Yes, please go ahead. Good Mr. job. Uh, some comments about AI. So one of the places where there's certainly bias, uh, although certainly trying to collect, correct it, is in the appraisal industry, right? Mm -hmm. So um, we can both get an appraisal, and it can come in a lot, you know, different on uh, something uh, that should be similar. Uh, I talked to two of the biggest appraisal firms in the state before I came here, try to understand what they were trying to do to make sure that they did things more equitably. It's been a lot of training, a lot of, uh, you know, trying to catch this. So now in most of the bigger shops, when they do uh, an appraisal for a low to moderate income individual, there's a second look. Now in our banks, we've had second looks for years. You, you keep, if you turn down a loan, there's somebody else that's taking a look at it, making sure that there are valid reasons to have it turned down. They didn't necessarily have that second look, but they do now. The other thing that they're using, and this is where AI can actually help us, they're actually using kind of precursor to AI tools to check appraisals and to check for keywords in those appraisals that typically trigger a lower value. So they're catching them with AI. And let me say a little bit about where we're using AI in the banking business. So it can be good, but I'm gonna tell you about where it can be bad too. Where, where it can be good and where it's being used in the banking business now, we're so heavily regulated, there's no bank in the country that I'm aware of that is using AI to grant credit. They are using AI in tandem with all of their trusted procedures and they're running it, and they're watching it, and they're trying to debug it. But they are running it in tandem. A, a place where AI is being used a lot is in customer service, and you've probably experienced mm -hmm. it. You've probably mm -hmm. called and talked to chatbots, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. chatbots get stuff <coughs> wrong. Uh, they have hallucinations, you know, th that's all part of <laughs> moving this thing on. And you probably have read some of the craziest stories about stuff that's going on with the chatbot that's way off base. Uh, 
and pulled the wrong information. The other place it's being used in is to help secure your accounts. It's being used by banks to watch for fraud in your accounts, your personal accounts and your mm -hmm. business accounts. Mm -hmm. It's being used very effectively, particularly in credit cards. B of A is one of the leaders in this. Uh, you know, to look for transactions that don't look like you. Uh, mm -hmm. And then they'll get a hold of you, they'll ask you, to, you know, did you do that transaction? And they're, they're protecting you. So where I'm really worried about AI is fraud. Because the fraudsters are actually ahead of everybody else mm -hmm. in trying to use AI. Mm -hmm. And if they call you on the phone and they get you to say just two or three words, they have your voice. They can grab almost all the data about you in the world off the internet, right? Uh, and so it's getting pretty easy to fake who you are. Fraud, I think, is one of the fastest growing problems for our country. It's a problem for you as individuals. It's a problem for us as financial institutions. We're taking massive losses right now. We don't have to disclose it as a separate line item. So you don't really see it, but every bank is taking huge fraud losses right now, and we are all going to have to work together and be very careful uh, to prevent fraud from, and in the real estate business, mm -hmm. you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> and title companies, fraud is really big and something to really worry about. That was awesome information, and you're right. Well, by the way, it doesn't discriminate. At, at all. It's, and growing. It's growing. So excellent. I love those answers. You guys are all a wealth of information and a wealth of information together. I love this panel. Um, we're going to open it up, take some questions now from the audience. So um, I'll start right here. Young lady right here. I, my question is really for um, Michael. Um, wait, Michael's from Community Bankers, right? And you mentioned CRA, and I'm listening to all of your panelists speak about the importance of the ecosystem. <clears throat> and at the Community Bankers Association, are the banks that you are overseeing or helping support, are they taking part in community benefit agreements? I know Bank of America has done a great job um, with CBA. Um, I work with the National Community Reinvestment Coalition at the national level and at the local level. And when we talk about getting every piece involved, CBAs are important um, to make sure that the local banks are taking a part to be able to provide these special purpose um, opportunities along with supporting small businesses and developers. So are you guys engaged in that area at all? Yeah, we are. Uh, yes, we are, uh, and it, it uh, definitely varies by bank. Um, you know, banks are the number one lenders to small businesses. We're the number one lenders to family farms. Uh, we are uh, collectively the number one lenders still in mortgages, but it's moving. It's really move. you know, like, it's moving away from regulated industries, uh, and the mortgage servicing business uh, look at Flagstar, we're the seventh largest mortgage servicer in the country, we're the seventh largest originator in the country too. Uh, and that business has moved, I retired in 2014, but now that business has moved into private hands. It's no longer, I mean, they're still big, and B of A is still big, Chase is still big, but it's moved <coughs> away. But the community banks, yes. I mean, and banks like Mercantile Bank, banks like Bank of Ann Arbor, banks like uh, Independent Bank, they, they clearly very engaged in all their communities. And, and we are open. One of the things I want to say to all of you is I learned so much trying to get ready for this program. I've spent two months reading a lot and learning a lot that I didn't know. Uh, and I'm more motivated now to get more banks engaged mm -hmm. uh, to help. Uh, and I wish, you know, next time there's one of these, I want to see a lot of banks here, I want to see a lot of credit unions here, I want to see legislators here. It's going to take everybody uh, to solve this. We need more people engaged, and I'm happy to engage in any way, 
and get any banks. You, you give me some cities where you want a bank engaged, I'll get them engaged. Thank you. And I'll just say that at, um, at NCRC, which is at the national level, mm -hmm. that's where they all come together. Legislation, bankers, housing counselors. And I'll just say that being in the industry for 15, 16 years, Mr. Kilgo said it, it's so important that the education piece yep. is, is key. And we need the banks and everyone else involved to actually promote the education piece because we will do that hand holding as needed so that they can be ready. Well, one of, just to follow up on it and I'll, I'll quiet down and then somebody else can answer. There are a lot of dollars from the Federal Home Loan Bank that went unused in Michigan. And it's a problem for all of us, right? We, we didn't get the word out to all the homeowners and to all the groups like you that this money's available. And the banks didn't do enough outreach, you know, to say, hey, we got this money. Uh, and we can put these programs, and these programs are already in place. So yeah, I'm 100%, I'm Jay is right. The education and awareness is really critical. Yeah. Can I add something real quick on to Michael's answer here? Um, so uh, a couple months ago, I met with Alex Contras, who's on Eureka's team. Uh, she kind of put, you know, it's her director of analytics, so she put two nerds in a room and let us go uh, try to figure stuff out. Um, and one of the things I said to him is, just because we're a national bank doesn't mean we're the biggest player in this market. So you can go, it's, it's publicly available data, the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, uh, humda.gov, I think. You can pull for any MSA who has the market share there, right? Because even though we're Bank of America and we're the second largest bank in the country, in Grand Rapids, I have like 0.6% market share. Lake Michigan Credit Union, which is a credit union, does a thousand times more loans than I do. So even though, like, obviously I'm, I'm local to Grand Rapids, I'm passionate about this issue, I, I want to be involved in the solution, the, the banks that should be in your local communities, the ones who should be at the table, are the top names on that list, right? And you can pull it by MSA. Uh, this question is for all the panelists. Um, when I think about this topic, I divide it into three groups. Uh, first phase is what we're talking about here, and that's how you get into a house. We talked about the different programs and the need for education and all of that. Okay. Second phase is staying in the house, learning how to pay the taxes, figuring out how to do your repairs, blending in with the community. <coughs> But the third phase is what I want all of you to talk about, and that is how do you pass this asset to your heirs to create generational wealth? Let uh, me just address my panel right quick because yes, yeah. for the sake of time, yep. please keep your answer to about a minute if you can, and yep. that way all of you will be able to answer that question. Awesome, I'll start with this one. Um, so NARAB this year had the 100 Cities Building Black Wealth Tour. Uh, we touched over 25,000 people in 100 different cities across the country. Um, they held one here in Detroit. Jidra did, the Greater Realtors of Detroit Association. Uh, in West Michigan, we held one too. Um, and we had a class called What to Do with Big Mama's House. Some of our lender partners didn't like that name, but we used it anyway. Because it's important, right? Mm -hmm. It's important. There's this asset that the family, unfortunately, we all have a time, right? Big Mama's time to go. It doesn't necessarily just mean throw that house on the market and sell it. You need to sit down with a professional and talk about what are the best things for our family to do with this house. If we keep it and we renovate it and maybe we, one of our family members moves in there or we rent it or maybe we put it on the market and sell it, but the best thing to do is to sit down with a professional to go over your options. Unfortunately, uh, I just lost my grandfather. He was 97 years old. He lives in Connecticut. I'm gonna go out there here in a couple months because now the probate case is open and all that stuff, but as the real estate expert, I'm gonna sit down with my family, which there's five different opinions, but sit down with a professional so that you can hear that third parties, what is the best option to do with this asset for our family. And sometimes it is renovate it and sell it. Sometimes it's sell it as it is. But sometimes it's, hey, let's keep it in the family because there's a residual income piece there or something like that. So the very good question. 
Paul, if you take the next one. Yeah, it helps to have a realtor in the family too, probably. <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll go to, to step two, which is staying in the house. And I'm going to take off my bank hat for a minute, put on my, my other hat here, which is I'm a board member of Habitat for Humanity uh, in Grand Rapids. Uh, and so what we did this year is, is really speaking to what Jay was talking about earlier with education. Uh, everyone knows Habitat. You're supposed to go and swing a hammer for you know, 2,000 hours, whatever, to, to get your home. Uh, we said, let's, let's rethink that. And rather than having it be go and put some shingles on, which you'll never have to do on your own, Let's do an eight hour class on what to do if your dryer stops working. What to do if your fridge goes out. What do you do if your air conditioning goes out and it's July? And how do you make those minor repairs before they become major issues? Uh, we also walk, walk them through with a home inspector, right? To say, what does an inspector look at uh, when they're going through a house? Um, and so from an educational perspective, there's that piece of it. Uh, and then there's foreclosure prevention, right? On the financial side of things, that's where HUD, HUD housing counselors are so invaluable. If you are behind on a mortgage payment, if you, are, you lose your job, you're experiencing financial hardship, the first thing you should do is reach out, right? Reach out to your lender, reach out to a HUD certified housing counselor because they can get, if the earlier you catch it, the earlier you start taking the right steps, um, the, the better the outcome is gonna be. Um, I'm gonna take off my hat too as the president of Housing Kent and just wear my experience as a black woman who has family members who live in abject poverty and are facing situations where we have housing assets currently that family members are maybe not in agreement about what to do. And um, I will tell you, and maybe this is just to share my experience, it is very difficult to figure out how to pass those assets on when you are dealing with individuals who are struggling with how to make ends meet. Because the immediate thing to do is to seek financial gratification and to sell it to get rid of it. The real thing is that they cannot afford to maintain the home. They can't afford to upkeep it. They can't afford to repair it. They can't afford to do the home improvements. They can't afford to pay the property taxes. Um, the house could easily get ready to go on foreclosure. And unless the rich auntie or the uncle or the brother or the sister comes in and maintains it, and then that's a whole nother set of challenges that the family experiences that can put strain on relationships that oftentimes are just not worth it for the family. And so it's not easy. And then you have predatory lenders kind of coming in or buyers coming in to want to try to snatch the property out because they understand the vulnerabilities of households of color oftentimes and the distresses that they're experiencing. And then you have other family members who are trying to protect them. And it is just a beautiful, hot mess <laughs> in our culture. And I just wanted to say I empathize with that and have no solution. But when we figure it out, I'll let you know. <laughs> uh, one, uh, I think, policy solution, we'll get to policy solutions later, but a policy solution for this situation is I think we need to make some changes to tax policy, uh, and we can do that here in the state of Michigan, I think, and I think you can get bipartisan support for it. One of the problems that happens when you inherit a property is you're the new owner and the tax basis flies up, right? Yeah. They, they reassess you at today's value, and if that property appreciated a lot, now you've got a tax bill that maybe you can't pay, mm -hmm. and you can't stay there. Mm -hmm. So I think we should all join together and try to slow that down. Uh, I, you know, look, I, I think municipalities have to pay for their services. They maybe have to nudge that up a little bit, but it doesn't have to go all the way up, and maybe we just do it for certain communities and maybe just for low to moderate income homes, whatever, but I mean, we, we can figure out what we cover, but uh, it's a big problem, and I think one that I think we can solve in Lansing, and this is not too heavy of a lift. We can do this. Okay. Could you, could you still have a question? Hey, my name is Roy McGee, I'm from Detroit, and all of you made some very good points particularly about getting involved, getting involved in the community. You talked about the importance of uh, leadership, advocacy, and most importantly about culture as opposed to race, which I think is beautiful because we're intertwined with all these issues that we're facing with regard to homelessness as well. What I like to see is a strategy that would hopefully involve perhaps the faith-based institutions that can have these meetings in neutral territory right there at the, at the church, 
and educate the population or the, the, the members of that church as well as the general community. That's something to think about and build on, perhaps, and, and add to that momentum, especially if you're talking about the issue of fraud, which is pretty commonplace, if we, as, as some of you have mentioned. So give that some thought, but I think the ideas are already there. You've got the best recipe you can imagine, but we've got to bring folks together and have a strong advocate. And I can't think of a better place than a neutral ground in a black church. Yep. Make that happen. So I, I love that idea. And we, we came to that conclusion, I think, far too late. Uh, but we've, we've been ramping that up in the last couple of years. Actually, in a couple of weeks, I'm going out to uh, New York with Harlem Congregation. Uh, with Reverend out there, and we're doing exactly what you're talking about, right? Is using them as that trusted voice to help us get our message out. Because, frankly, Bank of America is never going to be the cool kid in the room. No one's going to, if I say, hey, we got this big Bank of America event coming up, not a lot of people are going to raise their hands to go. But using the, the or not using, but, but leveraging the trusted voices to ultimately help everybody in the congregation is absolutely where we need to go. Amen. Yep. Please. It might have been a good idea if we had some mental health workers. Uh, so after this, we could all had to talk to somebody if we needed to. Because <laughs> this information is kind of depressing. But the banker, the guy next to the realtor, you started your conversation earlier with that you know, the customer, the consumer went to the bank and he was turned down because of the banker was not willing to lend the money. What is, the, what is that side of the fence? How are they being educated? so that we can get through that one barrier. Because you can't get the money. How can you buy the house? Yeah. And then all these other points go together with how do you maintain the home? And how do you, the taxes are going to go up. How do you pay for the taxes? And where's the money going to come from if the jobs are not here? And, you know, so anyway, but I, that, that's my question. Yeah, and, and so I think there's two pieces to it. One is is on the hiring side. Are we bringing in people, hiring people who represent the communities that we serve, right? We we absolutely have to. And then the the other side is the training and development side. And you know, part of that is, you know, the the blocking and tackling compliance training of you will not discriminate. Here are all the laws that we have to to follow. Uh, Michael said it earlier. We are one of the most highly regulated industries out there. But there's also the soft skills, right? Um, so I'll give you a good example. Um, you know, it is. One of the communities that, that often gets overlooked in this conversation is the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and so we've partnered with the Real Estate Alliance, which is uh, the LGBTQ trade organization for real estate agents, to bring their certified allyship training to our, our loan officers, to our, our bankers. Um, and then when we work with a, a number of other organizations to help make sure that we're having those conversations and having them in, a, in an appropriate way. Um, my question surrounds um, those with student loans. So um, quite often, those who can afford a home, who have an excessive amount of student loans, have been historically denied. Is there anything that is being done with the banks to kind of overlook that, relook at that policy, or anything along those lines? I don't know, Mike, do you want to take this one? Yeah. Or? I wish I had a better answer for you, but I don't think, uh, you know, we take all the obligations in. Uh, and the one, the one where there is some movement, and has been for a long time, we've always overlooked kind of medical. If what's dragging your credit report down is a medical uh, problem, an old bill that you couldn't pay, and that's it, you look past it. A lot, of, a lot of organizations look past it and they have loans that they can do that they may hold on their own books, but they're gonna take care of it. Uh, you know, the student loans are uh, more difficult, especially now that the deferrals have ended, right? Um, so it puts a burden on people that, uh, you know, for the last couple of years they didn't have. Uh, so I, I, don't, I don't have the answer that you're looking for, but, uh, you know, they do take your total uh, income into account. Uh, so, you know, if you've got the money to service the student loan and you've got the money to still service the house, it's not gonna hold you back. But if you don't, you know, if that student loan is really taking so much of your money that, you know, you, you can't cover both, then uh, we, we we don't, I, like I said, I, I don't have a good answer for you right now because that, that is an issue that's really come back now that all these payments have come back. Yeah. 
Okay. Gail. Michael, let me just expand on her question just a little bit. Um, when those student loans are on there and they do look at that, what is with the ones that are not, it's not time for repayment, but they're just calculating what they think a repayment might be and then using it as a debt to income against the person that's lending. Is there anything in place that would help that, prevent them from doing that? Sorry, I am yeah. a certified counselor. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so it depends on the lender and what product you're going into. And so even though they have a certain amount of debt, um, there has been a change to where if you go and get an income-driven repayment plan or if you're able to, um, basically the income-driven repayment plan or that half a percent, it used to be 1%. Yeah right, that they'll add all your student loans up and take 1%, but either they can do a half a percent or if you actually contact your servicers and get an income-driven repayment plan, and if that payment amount is less than the, one, the half a percent of your total student loans, that's what they'll use. I know that Fannie Mae and uh, FHA did make changes regarding student loans in the last year and a half to two years. Yeah, uh, Freddie did as well. Yeah. Gail, yes, because we're ahead. because we're running out of time, mm -hmm. I know some of the things that were important. We had homework to do at, with our policy solutions. I just want to touch on them real quick before we have to go. Please. So, again, I encourage everyone to talk to your local and state. It's an election year. Let's we have to hold these people's feet to the fire. It can't just be a sign that I'm driving by on my way home. It can't just be that leaflet that I get in the mail. We have to hold these people who are saying they're running for office for our benefit. Call them, send them emails, have coffee with them, go to their events and ask them the tough questions. But with that being said, uh, I don't know if anyone's heard of um, uh, Section 184 HUD program for Native Americans here in the country. There are, that's a special program for Native Americans in this country where they can get things like uh, one, one, and, one and a quarter percent down payments and they can get lower PMI and fixed rate 30 year mortgages, like really good loan programs. There's a way for the federal government to spread those programs more broadly across, right? African Americans and, and um, uh, Hispanic Americans and Asian Americans, there are people who were redlined for years and years and years. There's ways for the federal government to repay us and we should be eligible for some of these programs as well. So we can talk to legislators, they can change laws from the local all the way up to the federal level. Awesome, awesome. And those were a couple of policy changes that we, that we think you think would be um, good for sure to to pay attention to okay um, in the light of continuing and and finishing up um, let's see we've got a lot of information you've given a lot of information a lot of things that have gone on and that we can digest and as they mentioned Speak with people, speak with your elected officials, speak with the, um, everyone that understands what it is that you need and continue to talk to them to hope that we can get through. Um, it's very important when it comes to fair housing that these things and these initiatives move forward. So feel free to walk around the ex exit tables. We have a lot of organizations that went to share resources or information about what they've accomplished. So please visit those tables. And finally, there's an outdoor area with plenty, well, with plenty of grass and a great view of the water. So if you want to get a break and take some air and, and saw, see something beautiful, please do that. We want to thank our panelists today for everything that they have offered. Very good information, and you all men so well together. We're much appreciative of that. And I'd like to thank you all for attending to get this good information and possibly con continue on uh, with some conversation a little later. So thank you so much for coming, and uh, join us again. Have a great day.